Okay, we're back again. And uh, we're here with Odon Lafontaine. And as we said in the last episode, we're now going to move right into looking at the Quran itself and looking at different expressions in the Quran uh, that Odon is going to show. Uh, actually, when you look at these expressions, you need to apply them and put them in a historical context. And you will find that actually they give us a totally other or new narrative that the standard Islamic narrative doesn't give us. You intimated about it in the last episode, Odon. Now, go ahead and unpack these terms, like the people of the book and uh, the the term Kufar and the term the Nazarenes. Who are these Nazarenes? We're waiting to listen. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll share my screen. You can share your screen. And um, let you have a look at my presentation. Here it is. Uh, I intend to show you um, a kind of a glimpse of a global exegesis of the Quran text on the expression, the people of the book. What is a global exegesis? It's very simple. It is what Christian and Jewish scholars do on the on their sacred text. It is very basic. It is making a list of every occurrence of a specific expression in a text trying to understanding to understand it according to its context to its, to its context in the verses and comparing the senses comparing the meanings every meanings <coughs> one with another so for the people of the books we have something like um, a hundred maybe more uh, occurrences of the expression people of the book or book and uh, I've done the work for you, Jay, and for everyone. <laughs> I've looked into every occurrence in Arabic uh, and tried to make sense of every expression in its verse, in its context, and uh, comparing every meaning to uh, other meaning. And we see um, grand categories, grand topics emerging from his analysis. And this is what I will um, present uh, here. But first, um, let me introduce a kind of caveat, um, a warning. Uh, I've already told that uh, the, um, for a long time, scholars did not want to take the Quran as an historical source because they saw the Quran as a text without context. They did not know um, how it was written, um, when it was written. Some, dis some, some people, some scholars distinguished some layers. They, they realized that they were apart from a certain uh, time, apart from another time. It was very difficult. But there have been new Quranic studies um, this 10, 20, 30 years. And um, especially um, in the linguistical field and um, also in other fields. And now we have, uh, I think, enough material to consider the Quran as uh, an historical source and to uh, cautiously work the Quran with this global exegesis. So, for the people of the book and the coverer, we, we just want to start from scratch, putting aside the standard Islamic narrative, looking at the verses and seeing what the verses tells us. Who are the people of the book? Who are the Kufar, Kafirun, among them? So the people of the book in Arabic, they are the Al Al-Kitab, so the people, it's not really a book, kitab, it's, it can be translated by book, but etymologically, it means the writing, what has been written. It's not a book per se. A book could be a mushaf, for example. It's more of scripture, the people of the scriptures, or the prescriptions, uh, the prescription. It could be understood as the law, the law like the Torah. So... Here we already have um, a clue. As for the, um, the Kufar, the Kafirun, um, a word based on the uh, Arabic root 
Arabic and Aramaic roots KFR, they are supposed to be the infidels, the disbelievers, the misbelievers, according to the Muslim tradition, to the standard Islamic narrative. But according to the etymology of the word, they are the coverers, the one who cover. What do they cover? We will see. So, <laughs> here are the 32 occurrences of the expression, the people of the book. I've done the work, I've, I've told you. Well, I, we won't look right now into all of them, uh, especially because there are also 46 other occurrences of the word kitab in the Quran, uh, which characterizes a community, depending on the use it makes of the kitab. And, uh, 46 occurrences other than the expression people of the book. And here also, uh, I've done the work. I've looked uh, very thoroughly uh, into every occurrence and comparing the, the meaning uh, and so on. And so what result uh, did I get? Uh, the best thing will be to have a look at an iconic passage about the people of the book and the coverers. This is in uh, Surah 4, verse uh, 153 to 157. We will see here that we have a description of the people of the book and what they did and what they do. The people of the book ask you to bring down a book from heaven. They have already asked Moses something much more serious when they said, make us see God in the open. Then lightning strikes them for their wrong then they adopted the calf, even after the evidence have come to them. The evidence here being uh, Moses' tablets, the, the low tables. Uh, this is the right English word, the low, the tablets of the low. Uh, is it, Jay? <laughs> okay. It would be the tablets that Moses was given. Okay, okay, thank you, Jay. <laughs> when they were, when, remember, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen the Ten Commandment movie with Charlton Heston. Uh, when they rebelled and built the golden calf, God sent down these lightning bolts against them. And that must be what this is referring to. Lightning struck them for their wrong because they had they had uh, they had built this golden calf. Because mm -hmm. having seen all the great things that God had done in Egypt, yet as soon as Moses left, they trembled and they were fearful. And they wanted somebody to help them. And so they build a golden calf as, as an alternative to God. And so God sends down his wrath against them. Yes, That's yes. And thereafter, Moses had Aaron slay uh, thousands of Levites, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So at this time, things were very serious. But here in this verse, what do we see exactly? We see a commentary. It's a commentary about... Um, so some biblical verses, the one you just um, talked about, Jay, it's a commentary which um, is supposed to make a sort of analogy between the people of the book at the time of Moses and the people of the book nowadays. You will see this in the following verses. Uh, next verse, and to obtain their commitment, we brandish, them, we brandish above them mentor, we told them, enter through the door, prostrate yourself. We told them, do not transgress the Sabbath. And we, had made, we have made a firm commitment of them. We cursed them because of their breaking of the commitment. Their covering. This is very important here. It's, it's not their misbelief. It's their covering of the verses of God. The unjustified murder of the prophet. Of course, here we are not talking about the people of the book from the time of Moses. The commentary points at the category, the generic, general, regular category of the people of the book from Moses, from Moses uh, up to now. And it identifies the people of the book from uh, the seventh century to the wrong people of the book at the time of Moses. <clears throat> and it identifies the one who in the seventh century covered the verses of God with the one who, um, who caused the lightning struck uh, at the time of Moses. So among the people of the book, there are some, most of them, who broke their commitment and who covered the verses of God. 
and the murder of the prophet and the word, or arts are veil and impervious. What are they impervious to? What is it that they do not want to see in the verses of God? This is something very important in the Quran because this is why the Jews, why the people of the book are being constantly accused. There is something that they should have seen in the sacred scriptures and they, do want, they don't want to see it. That's and because they don't want to see it, they, covers, they cover the verses of God. We start to understand what's, what's at stake here. Now, Odon, are you going to suggest that this would be Muhammad? Because that is how they talk. Uh, that is the accusation today. Where do you see Muhammad here? I don't. And that's why, that's why they said they have covered <laughs> They have changed it. They have excised it. Uh, chapter 7, verse 157 of the Quran. Uh, in chapter 61, it says very clearly that that those, it's very clear that in the Taut and the Injil, you will find references to the, the one who cannot read or write. Obviously, the one who is called Ahmed, who is, would be a, 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 a diminutive of the word Muhammad. Now, what you're saying here is, and I'm assuming you're going to tell us that this is not what that, that's referring to. It's not what that's referring to. And even on, in, in those verses you, um, you, you quoted, uh, we could look into it and see that there is no unlettered prophet. The real translation is not unlettered. Or, no, no, it's the, um, the prophet that has been sent to the Gentiles, the one who has no book, who have no book. The unscriptured is the better way to say the it. Unscriptured. Right. Yeah. So it's not it's not about an unlettered prophet. It's something else. Umiyun. Something Umiyun else. means unscriptured. Exactly. And one could ask, who is the person that God sent to open the revelation to the nations? Is it Muhammad or is it Jesus? It's Jesus. Um, this will be obvious here because <clears throat> in the following verse, <clears throat> we see that the... The, the people of the book are being accused of covering the verses of God because of their covering the enormous calumny they pronounce against Mary. And we know what it is. We find it in the Talmud, in the Treaty of Sabbath. Uh, Mary is accused of um, fornication. And uh, Jesus is, um, is so uh, being accused of he is accused of being a, a bastard, the son of Pantera. Uh, this is the enormous calumny that is being pronounced against Mary. But who pronounced this, calum this calumny? Th those are the rabbinical Jews. The Jews who refused to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. This is what they were impervious to. Or arts are veiled and impervious. They are impervious to the messiahship of Jesus. And because of this, they covered the scriptures. They covered the prophecies in the Torah. They covered the prophets in order to hide the fulfillment of the prophecy by Jesus. This is, I think, what is being uh, taught by the, the preacher here. Here we have a preacher on the, in those verses who is teaching some people who already know about the Bible. He's making a commentary on the, of the Bible. He's not explaining the Bible. It's a commentary. And it's a very subjective commentary to accuse the coverers, the rabbinical Jews, of having covered the, um, the sacred scriptures, of rejecting um, the messiahship of Jesus and even he accuses them here of uh, the intention the uh, enormous assertion of having killed Jesus this is the very controversial uh, verse here in uh, Surah 457 uh, uh, and because of the word we really killed the Messiah Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God. So we see here that it pertains to Jesus, to the Messiah. This iconic passage is really, it is very rich, <laughs> very dense. 
we understand here that the people of the book are the Jews, the Judeans, uh, and that they have committed an enormous sin by refusing Jesus as the Messiah and by covering the sacred scriptures uh, in order to hide the prophecies and so on. Now, just uh, one question, Odon, in 157, verse 157, you have it translated, we really killed the Messiah Jesus, where in my translation is, they killed him not, they thought it was so. Yes, it depends, uh, it depends. Um, and here, I might, I might be... Um, I might be wrong because I wonder whether I took this particular verse from an uh, official translation or whether I translated it myself from um, Corpus Quran, uh, from the, um, so my own understanding. Verse. It's one of the most controversial verses, and I don't know of any Quran that translates it like that. I don't know of any translation that that said, we really killed Jesus. It says just the opposite. And because of their saying, we killed Messiah Isa, son of Miriam, ah. the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor yes. crucified him, but it appeared so... No, no, no the, 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 end, the end of the verse is missing here, but we killed him not, but we really killed the Messiah. This is what is being said in the verse. And because of their word, we killed Messiah. Yes, we killed the Messiah Jesus, we really killed him. It's not, Okay. My my great my great um, fault here is that the last part of the verse is missing. Okay. Will you forgive me for this? Never. <laughs> because the rest is correct. Huh? <laughs> the rest is correct. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So now we have understood that the people of the book are the people of the Jewish scriptures. They are the Jews. And the coverers are the Jews who cover the Torah and prophecies with their own interpretation. And um, they are the rabbinical or Talmudic Jews. Also, um, let's keep in mind that we are here maybe at the beginning of the 7th century. And it was the time of the um, publishing, the diffusion of the uh, Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud were uh, written in the 6th century and for some Jews who recognized Jesus as the Messiah, um, seeing those uh, new scriptures um, might have been something of a shock. And um, it can explain, this is an, an element of context to understand why the preacher here is so vindicative, so why he accuses his, his fellow, um, he, why he accuses the, um, the Jews, the people of the book, so much. Okay. So, um, I'm forced to do a synthesis here. If I had time, we could uh, look at every occurrence, and um, I should point to your audience, Jay, that I have almost done it on Mel's channel, Sneakers Corner, in some very, very long presentations. Uh, <laughs> a six hour presentation, something like this. Oh my. Um, this so would be also here. written. We won't do that here. We will tell people to go to Mel's Sneakers exactly. Corner. Look down at the bottom, you will see the <gasps> URL to Sneakers Corner. If you want to see the six hour presentation, where Odon goes through every one of the, what, 32 verses you're talking about? <laughs> 32 plus 46. Plus 46, goodness sakes. So, <laughs> we're so I'm also working on a, um, an article. I'm working on an article with Edouard Marie Galez on this topic, exactly. And um, my English book will be available very soon. In this, you will find many, many explanations of the, um, this thing about the people of the book. So, let's get back to our presentation. Um, we have seen that the people of the book have committed a horrible sin. They have covered the sacred scriptures. But the Quranic text tells us that there is a good community among the people of the book. There are, there are some good people. There is a good Yuma, Huma. 
this is the, the Arab word for it. Uma is a very interesting word because it's not just about community. It's, a, it's kind of like a, of a tribe. Uh, it's the same word that is used for uh, Israel, the, the 12 Israel, uh, Israel's tribes. Um, it pertains to Um, the mothers, the mother. And so the, the community is um, kind of a bloodline. It's um, um, an ethnic community within the people of the book. This community is called the standing community. The community will stand up like Abraham stood up in his place. The Makam Ibrahim we talked about is a place where Abraham stood, stood before God, stood righteous before God. So this group is being described as acting righteously among the Jews. Um, I've put here some references, Surah 3, verse 113, Surah 5, verse 66. There are only a very small number of them. They are a very tiny uh, group among the people of the group. We, uh, we see in Surah 5, verse 13, that they, they did not betray the, um, the Torah. They recognized Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, Surah 2, verse 101. Surah 4, 159. They are opposed to the rabbinical Jews and they are opposed to the Christians. Surah 2, 105. Um, this, this Jewish group, this good community among the people of the group, considers the Torah and the Gospel as sacred uh, scriptures, and it holds the unaltered text of the Torah and the Gospel. This is the issue of the uh, Mother Scripture. We have the Mother Scripture with us. This is what they are telling. We are the good community. We have the, the, the right, the good Torah with us, the unaltered text of the Torah, the uncovered text of the Torah, and it is called the Mother Scripture. Um, and also it is a group who has the true faith. Um, it, believe, it believes in God and in the day of the last, the last day, orders the proper, forbid the reprehensible, and is humble toward God. We see this in his, uh, another iconic uh, passage from the, the Quran in uh, Surah 3, from uh, verse 113 to 116, and also verse 199. But they are not all the same. The day, the day pertains to the people of the book. The people of the book are not all the same. There is among the people of the book a standing community, a righteous community, a community that stands before God, that at the other hours of the night recites the verses of God by prostrating itself. They believe in God in the last day, or that the proper forbid the blamed, and contribute to good works. These are among the good people, and whatever good they do, they will not be denied, for God knows the stakes well, as for those who do not believe, those who covers in Arabic, it is a, a word from on, on the KFR root. As for the coverers, neither their property nor their children will ever be able to save, to save them against God's punishment. And these are the people of uh, the fire that will dwell there forever. And um, <clears throat> a few verses uh, after this, there are certainly among the people of the book, those who believe in God and in what has been brought down to you and in those who have been brought down to them, they are humble to God and do not sell God's verses at low price. So here we see that, a <laughs> uh, contrario, that the coverers, those who do not believe, they sell God's verses at low price. This is, which is another accusation which is um, uh, proffered uh, toward them. So we have this good community among the people of the book. Um, what else does the Quran tells us about this good community? The Quran tells us that there was an alliance between, between this community, this good community among the people of the book, 
and the believers. This is in the Quran. We see in the Quran that the believers are urged into sharing women with the good people of the book and also sharing food, sharing table, which is the basis of society. A society is made by um, mixed mm, marriages, um, matrimonial alliances, and sharing food. In verse five, uh, five of the fifth surah, you are allowed the food of the people of the book, and your own food is allowed to them. You are allowed the virtuous woman of the believers and the virtuous woman of the people who receive the book before you. So here we have this allusion to the good people of the book. Of course, with the accusation we saw against the coverers, against the bad people of the book, this verse can only point at the good people of the book. And here we see also that the people of the book cannot be Christians because in uh, Surah 24 verse 3, we see that the believers cannot marry a Christian woman. The fornicator will marry only a fornicator or an associationist, an associator, which is a Christian. And the fornicator will be married only by a fornicator or associationist, a Christian. And this was forbidden to believers, which means this um, sharing of women is only between the good community among the people of the book and the believers. So here is an essential part of the alliance between the people of the book and the believers. And remember, we talked about Muhammad having a Nazarene wife. This is exactly what this is about, a matrimonial alliance between a Nazarene community, so they could be the good community among the, they might be the, com the good community uh, among the people of the book and the believers. But we saw also that Muhammad might have been uh, described as a Jewish prophet in the Doctrine of Jacobi, so maybe he was half Jewish himself. So, so um, yeah. Let me, let, uh, let me ask you a question. Who are the believers in these verses, according to what would you say are the believers here? The Muminun are whom? And Muminun. The, the believers are the one who listen to the, the preaching and who believes in it. So what's that simple? And from the, um, the reading of the Quran, we gather that they are Christians. They know about the Bible. When the preacher makes allusions, alludes to the Bible, make common story uh, about the Bible, they understand it. We have also verses in which um, we, we understand that they are very um, proficient with um, highly elaborated theological concepts such as Messiah, Spirit of God, the end of times. Um, and so they are, um, they are learned. So you're they, saying they are Christianized. Christian. They are Christianized. Then who are the associators? The associators are the Christian. They are the one who associate. Um, the, uh, they are the one who associate um, a divinity with the one God. The, uh, this accusation of associationism is not new. The, the Quran did not invent this. I'm, I'm aware of that, but it seems, like you're, it seems like you're confusing the believers, mm -hmm. the Muminun, who are not to have anything to do with the fornicators or the associators, yet the Muminuns are Christian, yet the associators are Christian as well. That no, to no, me no, no, no. The, 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 Muminun, the Muminun were Arab Christians who converted to the religion which is being taught by the preachers. So they, are, they, they, they have a, a Christian background, they were Arab Christians, they are, they are still Arab Christians, but nowadays, because of the teaching, they believe in something else, in something more. They believe, for example, that they have an Abrahamic um, heritage. Um, they believe that they share something with the good community among the people of the book. And so they are not associators anymore. And here we see why 
we don't find the word Masi or Masiun in the Quran. It's because the Muminun were Masi, they were Arab Christians, and they became, by, they became Muminun, and so they kind of um, renounced their Christianity. And, and so they accused their former um, colleagues in religion, Christian colleagues in religion, of being associationists. Okay, so basically what you're saying is they're no longer tri 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 triune believers. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe in Jesus' divinity. Exactly, okay. exactly. This is the point. They were converted to a kind of Unitarian faith by some preachers who, who, whose, whose preachings are the Quran, are in the Quran. They're like I think those, those okay, preachers the come... Oneness, the oneness, um, what is the group that's called that? Uh, the the uh, oneness... Uh, I can't remember what the name is. Oneness. Anyways, I'll look it up and I'll put it in there. So they're the group that really, you can see them even today. They are very popular and they are the ones who are, who no longer believe in Jesus' divinity. He is nothing more. In some ways, it's the Aryan concept as well, isn't it? Kind of. Kind of. I think uh, Arianism paves the way to this um, belief. But this is here not in France. This here in France, I've, I've come up. This is what Islam will become. This is not Muslim yet. This is a precursor to people who we exactly. now know as Muslim. This is pre-Islamic, proto-Islamic faith. It is not Islam yet because we do not have Muhammad. We do not have a, a prophet Muhammad. We do not have Mecca. We do not have a, a sacred book, a revelation. Here we have preachings from a community among the people of the book. And I think those were the, uh, the Quranic Nazarene. Let me, let me go on, on the alliance. You will see. Um, you will see. What, what is this alliance about? It is about teaching the good Jewish, good Jewish religion. Uh, in verse 3 of Surah 5, we see the preacher the preacher, not God. This is a preacher preaching. Like I, I told, like I told you, we're starting from scratch. There is no concept of revelation. We only look at the text for what what it means, what it tells us. When I read something like today, I have completed for you your justice, your religion, and fulfilled on you my my blessing. And I know. Uh, I see an instructor, a teacher telling his audience that his teaching is achieved. It is completed. It's okay. The program is, <laughs> the program is, is over now. I have completed for you your justice. So it's the word, the Arabic word, din. Din is um, often translated by the word religion, but um, it's not a very good translation. Din is the same root as the Aramaic and Hebraic Dan, like in Daniel. Dan is uh, the, the justice, the justice uh, in the biblical uh, meaning of the word. It's um, a, the set of religious rule which you must abide by in order to be a just, a righteous person. When you are just, for example, the just among the nations, it is because you have abided by God's justice, the Dean. So here we have a preacher telling his audience, okay, the teaching is over. I have, I have taught you everything you have to learn. And what did they have, they have to learn? If you look into the Quran, in the previous verses, it was a teaching about some um, uh, culinary uh, religious rules. Uh, the uh, diet, well, it's not a diet, it's um, dietary rules, which is kind of derived from the kasherut, from the, the, the kosher rules for the Jewish people. So uh, we see what the deen is about, what the religion is about. The religion is about abiding by a kind of uh, Jewish rule on um, uh, food customs. And there are also lots of other teaching in the Quran, 
by the preachers. They teach the believers on Jerusalem. We saw it uh, with Mel and uh, Joe and Paul's presentation, the place of Abraham, the Jerusalem Kibla, which is, um, I won't have time here to, to explain it, but we will. Um, okay. And um, another part of this alliance is being um, described in a metaphorical way, a sort of analogy. Um, we see the description of an alliance, a divine alliance, a divine covenant between Abraham, Ishmael, and God himself to rebuild Jerusalem's temple. This is in Surah 2, verse uh, 125. We confided to Abraham and Ishmael, confided, there is the Arabic root for covenant. We confided to Abraham and Ishmael this, purify my house for those who turn around, make a pious retreat there, bow to it and prostrate the, themselves there. But we already saw, we already know that the house is Jerusalem temple. We also know that Abraham never built a temple in Jerusalem. He built an altar for the sacrifice of Isaac. So here, it's not about history. It's not about, about the Bible. I think it's about an analogy. The figure, the seventh century figure of Abraham and the seventh century figure of Ishmael. So the good community among the people of the book and the believers, they have to purify God's house for those who turn around make a pious retreat, bow to it, and prostrate themselves. The divine covenant here, which is presented by the, the preacher, is about having this good community among the people of the book, and uh, Ishmael engaging in, in a divine alliance, a, a, a grand divine project to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And it's even clearer thereafter, if you really um, look at the Arabic text for what it is and not for what the standard Islamic narrative says it is and not for uh, what the translation says it is. In um, verse 127, 127 of Surah 2, we have literally this, then Abraham will raise the house from its foundation with the help of Ishmael. This is the, um, the goal of this divine covenant. You see the Arabic word which is used, raise, its conjugation is not at the past tense. You see in Arabic there, are, there is no um, specific conjugation for past or present or future tense. The conjugation is perfect or imperfect, and thereafter you use um, words and uh, combination to signify the future and so. But here, the conjugation is at the imperfect uh, tense, which means the action hasn't been made yet. The action is either being made or is to be made. And so the right translation here, according to the context, according to what we saw two verses before, is a conjugation in a future tense. Abraham as being the image, the analogy for the good community among the people of the book, will raise the temple of Jerusalem from its foundation with the help of Ishmael. Ishmael being the figure, the analogy for the believers, the Muminun. And we will see that it is Abraham, the good community among the people of the book, uh, was to do the work. Uh, is the one wearing the pants in the alliance. Um, so this is what the alliance is about. So there are many other descriptions in the Quran about this alliance, but here I'm trying to to get to the, um, the core of it. And now um, I will present you my hypothesis. My hypothesis, it is that this good community among the people of the book, which uh, we have defined, which the Quranic text defined, is in fact the Quranic Nazarenes. 
uh, we see this because at first the Quranic Nazarenes are not Christians, they are not associationists. Every time we see a description of the Quranic Nazarenes and the associationists, there are two different categories. They are never one and the same. For example, uh, in the in the verse uh, in Surah 3, uh, 65, 67, it's about Abraham being neither a Jew nor a Nazarene, and thereafter he was not also an associator. There we have three categories. He was neither a Jew nor Nazarene nor an associator. We have three distinct categories. If the Quranic Nazarene would have been Christians, associationists, the, the verse should have been Abraham was neither a Jew nor an associationist, or Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Nazarene. If you have to add associationist, it's because there are three different categories. And we see this in many uh, verses uh, in the text. We see that the Quranic Nazarene are, they belong to the people of the book, so they are Jews themselves, and they are not associationists, and they are different from the other Jews. We see, for example, many verses of um, condemnation of the Nazarenes, and this is the same condemnation this is, um, as the one uh, of the Jews, the Jews and the Nazarenes, the Jews and the Nazarenes, which means Jews and Nazarene have something in common. We see uh, in other verses that they, they also share the same, the same sacred scriptures, the same book. And so here, here is the verse about the um, Nazarene being the closest to the believers. And very interesting verse, Surah 5, um, 82. Um, we talked about it in, during the introductions and the, the last presentation, the previous presentation. You will certainly find that the fiercest enemies of the believers are the Jews and the Christians, those who associate. And you will certainly find that the closest to the believers are those who say, we are Nazarenes. In most translations, most translations, the, the um, translator choose to translate Nasara by Christian, which is an, an enormous contradiction because the fiercest of the enemies are supposed to be the associationists, so the Christian, and the closest to the believer are then to be those who say we are Christian. This is a contradiction. And some um, honest uh, Muslim translators such as Muhammad Abidullah, who was a, a French speaking uh, Muslim scholar, in his translation, he could not, because he wanted to be very true to the, his sacred text, he could not translate there Nazarene by Christian because he understood that there was a contradiction. And so here we see, for example, that there are two, uh, three distinct categories. The Jew who covers, of course, the, the, the bad people among the, the people of the book, those who associate the Christian, and another category, the Nazarenes. <clears throat> so <clears throat> during a time, they were the closest to the believers, and at another time, they became enemies to the believers. So it's in uh, Surah 5, uh, verse 51, all believers do not take the Jews and the Nazarene as allies, they are allies of one another. <clears throat> so they became enemies to the believers. But here we have something very, very strange. Like I told you in the previous presentation, Jews and Christians, they were supposed to, they were arch enemies during the seventh century. So here we see that Nazarenes cannot um, mean Christian. So uh, here the standard Islamic narrative is very wrong in pretending that the Nazarenes are, um, are, are Christians. But one thing is also very strange. If you look at verse, uh, 89 in Surah 4, you will see here that the people, the believers, are not supposed to take the Jews for allies because the Jews are allies of one another. And so here it might, it might be 
that the expression and the Nazarene is an interpolation, something that was added to the original text, the original uh, preaching, because the Quranic Nazarene became enemies to the believers. And so they, they had to be condemned. And in the text, something was added in order to condemn them as, um, as being Jews. Because in the end, the Quranic Nazarenes belong to the people of the book, so they are Jews. And why is it that they, they had to be condemned? Why? It's because the Quranic Nazarene broke the alliance. We see this in verse 14, Surah 5. And those who say, we are Nazarenes, we have made their commitment, we took their, their vow. Here it is the um, uh, Arabic root for covenant, but they have forgotten some of what was reminded of, uh, of them. So we arose enmity and hatred among them until the day of the resurrection and so on. Here we see that the Quranic Nazarene, some, they are accused of having broken their commitments, forgotten something, something went wrong, and the alliance with the believers is broken which could explain why the Quranic Nazarene have become enemies to the believers. So it's very quick, it's very short, it's a very, very synthetic view on a very complex topic. <laughs> but uh, I think with what we just saw here, we can draw some, some conclusions. Um, the first one is that we have proved with the Quranic text and only with the Quranic text, without any reference to the external sources and so on, only with the Quranic text, we have proved the existence of a righteous Jewish group, a, a good community among the people of the book, which was allied for a time with the believers. And I think they were the Quranic Nazarene. One could contest this hypothesis. It might have been another Jewish group. But when we look into the Quran, it really makes sense with the Quranic Nazarenes. So we have proven this with the Quranic text only. And then if we compare what we have found here with the external sources telling us about Jewish people leading the Arabs to the Temple Mount when the Arabs took Jerusalem, for example, when we compare this to the Doctrina Jacobi telling us about uh, a Jewish prophet which rose among the Saracen, when we compare this to what we have found outside of the Quran, it converges. And I think we, um, we have something there. We have something. This Quranic proof is something new. And when we cross it, we compare it to other evidence, it's um, strongly reinforce um, the hypothesis of um, a Jewish group, um, the Nazarenes, um, having influenced the, the beginning of Islam. But the question remains to be asked, did the Quranic Nazarene add an impact on all Arab parties, all Arab factions. Because the, at the time of the seventh century, there was not a unique, um, united Arab, um, Arab party, Arab uh, who, who conquered the, um, the Middle East. There were some in Mesopotamia, some in Syria, some in Egypt, and some in Jerusalem. So obviously, I think what we found in the Quran with what we found in the Quran, we can uh, assert that the Quranic Nazarene were related to the, um, the party, the, the Arab faction that took Jerusalem. But we don't know for sure whether they had an influence on the other parties. One thing to, um, to, to, to add here uh, is uh, the, um, the topic of the false prophet, which we find in the standard Islamic narrative. The standard Islamic narrative tells us about false prophets, prophets other than Muhammad, preaching uh, another revelation, <laughs> another divine revelation to the Arabs. There were uh, four main figures uh, of those false prophets, and uh, some of them 
could be related to the Nazarenes because of the name. Um, <clears throat> I've got a friend, uh, a scholar, who did um, research on, on this topic. And you can also find it in um, Robert Oyland's book in God's Pass. He has a, a developed footnote about the, the false prophets. Uh, we know for sure now <laughs> that the Quranic Nazarene had uh, a very strong influence on the, um, on the Quran itself because of what we read in the Quran. They had a very uh, sure influence on the, the material which will become the Quran, the Ur Quran, uh, as uh, Gunther Luling uh, put it. But we don't really know how the Quran was constituted, was made. Was the Quran a book for all Arab faction? Or is, is, was it only the book of uh, the one faction that took over Jerusalem? So lots of questions to, to be answered there. Um, also, we know now, or we know now, <laughs> that the Quranic Nazarene existed, thanks to the Quran, they existed. Edouard Marie Galez put uh, an hypothesis about the origins of those Quranic Nazarenes. Where do they come from? And uh, he thinks that they, they came from the first century, from the, the, the first Judeo-Christian community of Jerusalem, that they were Jews, who did not want, they were uh, Judeo-Christian, who did not want to come back to Jerusalem after the first siege, after the year 70, when the Roman destroyed the temple. Um, the Judeo-Christian at this time, they fled Jerusalem before the siege, and they took refuge uh, in Jordan and in Syria also. And they came back to Jerusalem after the siege, after the destruction of the temple. And the um, chronicler, the, the author of this time, tells us that some of them did not want to come back to Jerusalem and that they kept uh, on the, um, they, they, they remained in Jordan, they remained in southern Syria, and they might have constitute, constituted the beginning of, the, of a Nazarene movement, which we will find um, the aftermath in the Quranic text. Also, we have here a groundbreaking discovery about the origins of Islam. It makes us understand um, the apocalyptical expectations of the believers, of the proto-Muslims, the pre-Muslims, why they, why they wanted to take Jerusalem, what they did there, and then we can, um, we can form the hypothesis of the role of the Messiah. They wanted to take Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, to trigger the apocalypse, to, to have judgment day. And um, we see, um, especially in the Hadith, that the Messiah is supposed to have um, a very strong part in the apocalypse, in the Muslim apocalypse. So maybe, maybe building the temple was the way, was the solution, the, um, the recipe for, the, um, for having Jesus come back. And so we understand that Islam did not emerge from the preaching of a prophet in Mecca and so on, but that it emerged from um, a long process. There were, there has been at first the teachings, the preaching of the Quranic Nazarene to the believers. There has been the um, Jerusalem event. They took Jerusalem, they rebuilt the temple and they, they were waiting for the Messiah to come back and he did not come back. And so the apocalypse failed. There was a sort of failed apocalypse. And this is why, I think this is the reason why the Arab leaders um, struggled then among themselves. This is the reason of the fitna, of the civil war between the Arab leaders. 
the apocalypse failed. Jesus did not come back. He did not establish God's kingdom on earth. And so the Arab leaders fought among themselves <clears throat> um, because they all, are, they all had different opinions, different, um, different um, methods uh, to establish God's kingdom. Some of them wanted to wait for Jesus to come back even after the failure. Some of them pretended to be the Messiah himself, such as uh, Ali, for example. Uh, others uh, pretended to establish God's kingdom by themselves. And uh, the struggles, uh, the turmoil between the Arab leaders uh, led to the um, emergence of the, the strongest, Abdul Malik, at the end of the 7th century, who created a new entity, the Caliphate, and who pretended to be himself God's Caliph. We, so we see this on his coins. We should make a video on coins, Jay. <laughs> we see that uh, Abdul Malik is the first of the Arab leader to mint Caliph on his coin, and especially God's Caliph, God's Lieutenant, which means Abdul Malik kind of pretended that uh, he, he had established God's kingdom on earth, the Caliphate. And thereafter, there was the Abbasid revolution. They, they took over the Umayyads. They took over the, they took over God's kingdom. And they pretended also to be God's caliph, but they could not legitimate the power um, on Abdul Malik's uh, pretension. They had to invent something more. And so from God's caliph, uh, Khalifat Allah, they became the um, successors of God's apostle, Khalifat Rasul Allah. The Umayyads were not called Khalifat Rasul Allah. They were called Khalifat Allah. And with the Abbasid, we have something else, Khalifat Rasul Allah, which means that they assume a, a complete power over the, um, the caliphate without any reference to the Messiah Jesus, who did not come. Abdul Malik, he kind of pretended to be the Messiah himself and to, to have uh, Jesus' messi messianic power in order to establish God's kingdom. But with the Abbasid, we have something completely new with a new justification, a new, um, a new religion to justify himself, uh, Islam, hence the invention of the divine revelation, the invention of a prophet to, <laughs> to reveal the revelation and the evasion of all the standard Islamic narrative. So this last development that I made about Islam's emergence, it will need to be, um, it needs more proof than what we have found in the Quran. Huh? It's a development, of course. Um, I would gladly develop it in presentations to come. But I think here we have, um, with this Quranic study, uh, a very profound key for the understanding of the uh, beginning of Islam and of Islam itself. Well, thank you, Odon. Uh, you've done an awful lot of unpacking and much more yet to come. And I think it's been interesting that you, from your perspective, you are looking not only at the seventh century and trying to understand how the, un the Quran will help us to see that. Assuming, of course, from your perspective that the Quran existed early and that it would be added to as, a, as the Abbasids do that later on in the 8th and 9th century. <clears throat> but if you look at the Quran and you understand it from the words that you're using and you wanted to zero in on Ali Kitab and you wanted to zero in on Kufar, those two words especially, to show that really there is there was a inter tribal, you might say, tussle that was going on as people were trying to, people were trying to create an ascendancy one over the other. And there was a, certainly a Jewish Christian flavor. But what's fascinating, you're saying that there was a third entity, a Nazarene. Quranic Nazarene is the name you give it. And that's your name for it. Many people will give it other names. Uh, but you're saying that this Quranic Nazarene were not really Christians and that they didn't associate divinity to Jesus Christ, nor were they Jews in that 
they they pulled away they from not rabbinical Jews. Well, they're not okay. And by rabbinical Jews, you mean literal literalistic Jews. Jews. Mm-hmm. Is that what you mean by I, rabbinical? I, rabbinical. Uh, no, no. Uh, by rabbinical Jews, I mean Talmudic Jews. Uh, Jews who. Um, who obeyed the time the Talmuds. Okay. So these Quranic Nazarenes, and the word Nazarene is the Arabic word that you're looking at that is in the Quran, defines them as uh-huh. what? And why, since you're calling them Quranic Nazarene, because you can find that word in the Quran, that's why you're given the word Quranic. Am I, am I correct? Yes. And I'm doing this also because... Um, you see here in France, the, the, um, the, the, name, the name that has been given to them is Judeo-Nazarenes. It is the name that Edouard, Edouard Marigalès um, um, chose. In order to distinguish the Nazarene from the Quran, to distinguish them from the other Nazarenes, the Nazarenes that we find in the ancient sources, the Nazarene that we find in Epiphanius or in the, the letters between uh, Jerome and Augustine. You see, there is a lot of literature about Nazarenes. And um, I've, I've um, talked about the very first Christian being called Nazarene, for example. And it's all very confusing. And the, the people tend nowadays, because they know about the... Um, my hypothesis about the Quranic Nazarene, they tend to confound Christian Nazarenes, Epiphanius Nazarenes, um, uh, St. Augustine Nazarenes with the Quranic Nazarenes. Okay. So by naming them Quranic Nazarenes, I intend to, to point at the fact that it is the Quranic text that proves their, their very existence. Okay. And they are defined by the Quranic text. All right. So by looking at the Quranic text, we need to know, we then can be, get the definition for them. And you're going to be unpacking that from here on out. But you added a whole new nomenclature that we hadn't heard before. Now, over, and Mel has heard it because I know Mel has talked about it. He's been quoting you. So we do know it from those who know Mel, but that we've not that's heard. New, that's new. Um, on, on Mel's channel, on Sneakers Corner, I presented um, a diagram which showed the, um, the evolution of the um, situation. At first, you had the Quranic Nazarenes, uh, the Kufar, the Mushrikun, and um, with, the, um, with the events during the 7th, 8th centuries, and so on, and the even- invention of the standard Islamic, uh, standard Islamic narrative, um, things evolved, and the meaning of the word changed. For example, Nasara at the beginning, it meant Quranic Nazarene, Nazarene. And according to the standard Islamic narrative, 200 years later, um, it meant Christian. So um, I, I think now we have proven that the beginnings of Islam were uh, kind of triggered by a Jewish group, a very odd Jewish group, a Nazarene Jewish, Judeo Nazarene group. And uh, the Quranic text tells us that uh, this group made an alliance with some Arab, some Christian Arabs, uh, an, alli- an alliance in order to take Jerusalem and uh, rebuild the temple and trigger the apocalypse. This is how Islam began. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been excellent. This, I, there there are going to be people who will react. Some people will have already heard this, having been on Mel's channel. Others, the majority, will probably not. This will be brand new to them. But for those who are watching, can you see, we are, as best we can, trying to see what actually did happen. We've already said there are problems in the SI, the SIN, SIN standard Islamic narrative has not done its job, has not, is not adequate enough, is not at all. Well, it does not resonate for what we're seeing in the 7th century. Therefore, people like Odon, people like Mel, like Murad, like Paul, and also like Joe, are trying to go back and try to help all of us walk through and see what is actually there. What uh, Odon has done in this episode is to look at the, the Quran itself. 
and up opening uh, references in chapter five, uh, references in chapter four, uh, references that he's had in other areas, such as chapter three and also in chapter two, looking and trying to unpack it by looking at the words that exist, trying to find who are these people that we're talking about, because it is people that actually created Islam. It is people who had a vision of in this case, it looks like they were waiting for the Messiah to return, and he did not return. And so what happened then, of course, as they fractured and went into different other groups, that is what we will be doing next. And what I would like, Odin, what I would like you to do is come back and we'll do the coins next. Because I think the coins actually are artifacts that don't disintegrate. They don't deteriorate there. You can hold them in your hand. You can show them up. We can show the images and just follow the sequence. You've done it a little bit with the, with the Quran here, but it, it's kind of fluid because we don't know when the Quran was written. We don't know exactly what period it's referring to, but coins don't have that problem. Coins mm -hmm. aren't fluid. They don't change. They stay when they're minted. They're as good today as the day they were minted. And because we can then look at them, we can also d d look and follow the sequence. So, this has been terrific to get it from a Quranic perspective, from get it your perspective. I think it'll be even better when we do it with a coin perspective. So next time we meet again, hold on, we're going to look at the coins and we're going to unpack them. I understand you even have some of them and you've asked me to go buy some of them. So maybe by the time we talk, I'll have done just that. God bless you. It's been great having you here with us. Thank Those you, of you who want to respond, you can, there's the comment box right at the bottom. Do comment. Odon has promised that he will look at your comments and he will try to respond. If we get good questions, we will then do another session trying to answer those questions. So Odin and I will probably come back again to, the, to come back and we will make sure uh, that we do name who you are so that you get credit for what you are saying. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thanks a lot for coming on board. Thanks a lot for unpacking it. Thanks a lot for staying with us. And for the rest of you, let's hear your comments. This is Jay and Odon. We're 3,000 miles apart, five hours difference. He's ready to go to bed. Uh, that, it's about one o'clock in the morning for him. But it's been